Hello everyone. Today we shall be exploring this ancient and extinct volcanic system here in Deary, Idaho. Behind me is Potato Hill, which is believed to be a resurgent dome and a possible volcanic caldera right here in Deary, Idaho. Some of my longtime viewers may even recognize this location. This is Potato Hill and to the right behind me through these trees back here is Cherry Butte which are believed to be two resurgent domes within a possible volcanic caldera here in Idaho. Now, it is believed that these volcanic rocks, or the volcano erupted during Eocene possibly, unless it's changed, the exact date is not 100% known because they have not done accurate age dating with on these volcanic rocks. However, that might be outdated information who knows, that was taken from one of the geologic maps of the area, which I believe was made in 2005 or 7, so that may have changed since then. Potato Hill and Cherry Butte, or the Potato Hill Volcanics, are made up of Dacitic to Rhyolitic lavas. So these lavas are going to be a thicker, high viscosity lava and magma, and they're also usually more explosive when they erupt, especially Rhyolitic lavas, and a lot of these Rhyolitic lavas can be found and volcanic calderas on the planet in different locations, such as Yellowstone. This is believed to possibly be a resurgent dome, which if you don't know what a resurgent dome is, that is when after the caldera forms, so the major eruption already happens, you'll have magma that wants to push its way back up, but instead of coming up and erupting, which it may do, it tends to push up the land and it'll start to dome up because that magma is pushing up like a piston, and it's making the land on top of it dome up, creating a resurgent dome. And this is not the only resurgent dome. Cherry Hill over here is also believed to be a resurgent dome. And they believe it's a caldera due to the circular shape of the volcanic rock exposures in the area. Let's start off by going up the road and see what kind of volcanic exposures or rocks that we can find along the way. And then, We'll see if we can make it to the top of Potato Hill and see what kind of interesting rocks can be found up there and what interpretations we can make from them. So let's get going. Here we have an interesting sample of some of the volcanic rock here. And if you take a look here at this clast, where my thumb is here, you can see that it looks like it was rotating slowly. We also have some little inclusions of other rocks and class of other samples here that show that a little better could have been a class that was erupted out of the lava from the conduit and incorporated within to the flow. You can see there's some other classes here and you can see the little banding layering which could be flow banding possibly. One of the things I'm looking for is the possible location of the conduit where the magma was coming up through the surface and erupting. So the source of the eruption itself. Since these were Dacitic to rhyolitic lavas, they weren't flowing quickly like the basaltic lava flows that we see in Hawaii or in Iceland currently. These flows would have been much more viscous, so they would have flown a little slower, they would have been thicker as well, and likely as they were coming up out of the earth, rhyolitic and dacitic lavas tend to be more explosive. Like Mount St. Helens has a dacitic lava composition that sometimes erupts out of Mount St. Helens. I believe that is what erupted during the 1980 eruption. However, Mount St. Helens can also have andesitic lavas, I believe. And here we have dacitic to rhyolitic, with rhyolitic being the most explosive of the lavas and magmas. Not too far away, we have another outcrop of rock. We just have the regular looking lava here, which I believe is dacitic in composition for this particular sample. It may be rhyolitic, but you can see there are some large glass within the rock. But lack of that banding look that we saw earlier. We have another lava rock with some larger class, this time a little darker in color. But you can see the class within the rock here. I'm now about halfway up the dome on Potato Hill, and behind me we have Cherry Butte, which is the other resurgent dome. Now from a distance, these two domes, Cherry Butte and Potato Hill, which I'm on, can look like the actual cones of the volcano, where you'd expect the eruption to happen from the top there. But since these are resurgent domes, they can have a similar shape because again, the magma pushed up from below, 
making the dome structure. And since these are old extinct volcanics, erosion has also taken place here, which can kind of round out and make the dome structure more jagged, creating more steepness like this peak here or the hill. But I'm about halfway up on Potato Hill and we have some more outcrops of the volcanic rock, which I will show you here because we have some more class. So here we have another class, this lighter colored rock within the darker volcanic rock here. And here's a class and here is another class. Like I mentioned earlier, in some locations you can actually find the conduit material in the area. And in some places you can find intrusive porphyritic dacite that is cutting into the flow rock, the lava flows. And since the porphyritic dacite is cutting the lava, the lava is there first. And since you have a magma that's actually intruding up through the lava flow, which lava flows are shallow, their surface, that shows that magma continued to be injected up towards the surface, intruding, and possibly fueling more eruptions after the initial flows, which could have been before or after or during the resurgent dome uprise. Made it to the top of Potato Hill. Quite the view, a little bit hazy in the distance from all the wildfires to the east up here. Let's check out the surrounding area and see what we can find up top. So let's take a look at the surrounding geology and landscapes. So right down there we have Cherry Butte, which is the smallest of the resurgent domes. We also have metasedimentary and metamorphic rocks out here. We also have the farm areas, which are windblown silts. And then further that way, we have some granitic plutons and batholith rocks. Here's another clast. This is a granitic looking clast, probably from the Idaho batholith Cretaceous granite, just to the north of here. There's another clast. There's another clast. And not only will you find granitic batholith rocks from Cretaceous and Eocene, you'll also find metamorphic and some sedimentary structure rocks as class within the lava as well. So whatever's down below, when that magma interacts with it, it can pull it up and bring it up to the surface. And we have all three of those rock types around. Igneous, Cretaceous intrusive rock, and Eocene intrusive rock, as well as the metamorphics, like the schist and gneiss that I pointed out earlier, and a couple of the quartzites and sedimentary rock that can be pulled up into the magmas and erupted at the surface. And they can be slightly melted and altered within that magma or lava, depending on how hot it is and how long they stay within the melt. And there we have another clast. You can see that they're quite angular. And the thing with dacitic and rhyolitic lavas, they're also lower temperature lavas. So what I mean by lower temperature is they're about 800-ish to 900 degrees Celsius, while lavas like basalt can get much hotter, which makes them a little bit more fluid. And since these are cooler, magmas and lavas, they're going to be more viscous because of that. But not only that, it also depends on the composition. Rhyolitic and dacitic lavas have more silica content, and the silica content, as well as other things, but mainly the silica, silica content, is what is going to influence the viscosity and thickness of that lava or magma, as well as the explosiveness of it when it reaches the surface. Rhyolite has more silica value, so it's going to be more explosive than dacite. Now, as mentioned, the Potato Hill Volcanics are believed to be Eocene in age, although they haven't been officially age dated, if that information is still accurate. So, there is relative ways you can age date the Potato Hill Volcanics. They're believed to be Eocene because there are some Eocene intrusions around here that have been dated, such as Eocene granitic plutons, as well as Eocene rhyolite dikes that are not too far from here. So it's likely that that intrusive activity eventually caused the volcanic activity we see here at Potato Hill. There's also other evidence to suggest it's Eocene age. Mainly, we have the Columbia River flood basalts, which was a large eruption of flood basalt lava that covered most of the state of Washington, Oregon, and parts of Idaho. And those flood basalts came here, and they surrounded and buried part of Potato Hill Volcano here. So the entire dome 
out here is surrounded by Columbia River flood basalt, which has now been mainly overlain by this wind-blown silt that makes the Palouse farming hills. You probably just heard those fans turn on. I'm right next to a giant cell tower that's at the top of Potato Hill. Older than the Columbia River flood basalts, there's also the Potlatch Volcanics, which are just behind me. Within this valley, you can find some of the basaltic lava flows that erupted, which is similar to the Columbia River basalt. However, the Potlatch Volcanics erupted 26 to 25 million years ago. Also associated with the Potlatch Volcanics is a felsic group, although it, they're, the outcrops of it are not far and spread out. There's only a select few outcrops of this felsic um, volcanic rock that was erupted that I cannot think of how to pronounce. But it was mainly a basaltic lava flow uh, well, the outcrops of the potlatch volcanics are more widespread. They filled in this valley, and you can also find evidence of the potlatch volcanic flows on the other side of this mountain peak, which means that the flows at one time flowed around that peak right over there. However, most of the flows have been eroded away. Several miles to the south of here, potlatch volcanic flows have also been found in a small outcrop, which suggests that this entire valley might have been filled in with basaltic flows from potlatch volcanics, which has since been eroded away or buried by the Columbia River flood basalts. Which means if Potato Hill is Eocene, which is about 50 million years old or so, or 40 million, the potlatch volcanics would have also buried Potato Hill before the Columbia River flood basalts, which then would have buried even more of Potato Hill volcanics. There's likely more volcanic deposits and rocks that are locked away underneath the Columbia River flood basalts as well as the potlatch volcanics possibly, preventing them from eroding away. So after the eruption that took place here happened and you had the resurgent dome build, a lot of that started to erode and weather away through time until those lava flows came in and sealed them in, protecting them. So a lot of the volcanic story may yet be up for interpretation here because a lot of the deposits likely are buried below all these lava flows in the area. Something that's also interesting to think about is if Potato Hill volcanics are Eocene in age, behind me again is the Cretaceous Age granitic plutonic rock, which is intrusive, and the Eocene, Eocene aged lava is in contact, which means the flow contacted the Cretaceous mountain, which means that intrusive granite, it's intrusive. It forms underground and cools underground slowly. That's what makes granite. While the volcanic rock I'm on now has to breach the surface and it cools quickly, which makes fine grain crystals, which is why it's extrusive. And when you have extrusive contacting a granitic rock, that means that granitic rock had to be uplifted to the surface, which is no big deal, not really a surprise. But when you think of it this way, that is Cretaceous Age granite. So let's say about 60 million years old. And this is, I believe, Eocene, so about 50 to 40 million years old, which means that you had to have enough uplift or erosion, or likely both, probably both, because of tectonic reasons that were happening here. Within 10 to 20 million years, that had to be uplifted and eroded away for this lava to come in contact with it, which means there was a lot happening here quickly over geologic time. And 10 to 20 million years may seem like a lot, but geologically, that might be decently quick, if I'm thinking of this right anyways. But that's, that's kind of cool. It kind of gives you a tectonic, possibly a tectonic view or an erosional view, or both, likely, into the area here. So you have this likely intruded, and then after it cools, you have more uplift occurring with definitely the Eocene extension. So you're gonna have a lot of deep rocks coming up to the surface, which probably pulled that up along with it. Then you had that Eocene melting, which created more magmas and eventually fueled the volcanic eruption that happened here. The sun is beginning to set. And I'm going to slowly head on down the top of Potato Hill. And let's look at more of these rocks. You can just, whoa, as long as I don't slide and fall down the mountain. <laughs> but you can see they're just loaded with class up here. 
Here's a close-up. You can see the clasp here that looks like a granitic clasp. There's that one here that's about the size of my fist. And there are just tons of smaller clasps within this volcanic rock. There's even a big clasp right there. When you have a caldera form an eruption, you usually have ring faults, uh, if that's what they're called. So it's like um, ring faults or ring fractures that go around the caldera, creating like a circle or a bowl shape. You can think of it like a piston again. So as the magma is feeling the initial eruption, so much magma is emptied out of the magma chamber that the surrounding overlying rock will fall into the chamber like a piston going down. And when that happens, it can squeeze out some of the magma from below, causing eruptions to occur or explosions near the edges of the caldera along these ring faults. So while the caldera was collapsing, you probably had a lot of pyroclastic eruptions and flows coming from the edges of the caldera. So instead of an eruption maybe coming from the center, you probably had more eruptions originating along the edges of the caldera as it slowly collapsed inward. And caldera collapses can happen over time, not right away. They're not usually instantaneous as far as we know, or as far as I know, I should say. They tend to seem like they happen over a certain amount of days, and there's actually a great USGS video from the uh, caldera collapse in Hawaii. They actually have time-lapse footage of that, so if you want to check that out, I'll have a link in the description so you can go check out the USGS footage and see a caldera collapse happen before your eyes in a time-lapse footage. I believe it took a matter of several days to maybe weeks for it to fully collapse inward. Alright, it's time to head on out of here, and next let's go to the office and look at the samples, and then to Google Earth to get a good, nice aerial view of the area. Let's go! Alright, so let's take a look at some of the rock I collected from Potato Hill. So first, let's look at these rocks. They're all the same color, they're gray, but they have these little clasps in them. You can see all these little fragments. Now, I thought these were volcanic lava rocks, and uh, I'll also include this one here. Let me find it. Uh, there it is. It's a little darker color. So I originally thought these were volcanic lava rocks from like a lava flow, but, but as it turns out, when I brought these into my professor, she took a look at them, and apparently these are not lava flow rocks, but these are like a, a welded tuff. So these are like rocks that formed from ash. So as the ash fell and compressed, um, eventually it became a rock, but that ash fall from the volcano trapped in a lot of fragments, so that's also been preserved in the rock here. So this is just a whole bunch of ash that is now fused together in a rock, which now contains other fragments of other rocks, so it's basically a welded tuff is what they call it. Now this piece here, I believe, is an actual lava flow rock from actual lava, possibly. We'll set that aside here for a second, but let's take a look at this rock here. Let me put some more light on this so you can see it a little better. But right about here where my thumb is, I believe that's a chunk of pumice. So pumice is another type of volcanic uh, material that is ejected from the volcano, and pumice will float on water right there, I believe, and right there is some more chunks of pumice. I'm not sure what the black lineations are in the rock, but this is all from the eruption. And these black rocks right here might be that uh, darker lava rock right over there. So when the eruption occurred, the blast was so powerful it blasted chunks off of the existing rock so these were likely from very strong violent eruptions here's another fun rock right here you can see there's some more of the pumice and stuff in here more rock fragments and if you look right there at this one where my thumb is you see how that grain right there has been rotated but that is when you have the ash compressing and it might have been on a slope so as you get a lot of thickness added to these ash beds that are falling down, they're compressing, and if they're on a slope, they're going to slowly kind of crawl downhill. So that's why this grain kind of started to rotate. Here's another one. You can see all these nice little lineations and lines. Lots of little pumice grains in here. Now this one right here is my favorite. It's basically the same thing. It's more of that ash or welded tough rock, but this time it's really dark. And I'm not sure what causes the different coloration likely different eruption and maybe different compositions. 
something's going on. I'm not quite sure, but as you can see, there's this large fragment right here, and you got this large fragment right here. Now, if you look at this fragment, it kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? it? Looks really similar to this stuff here, gray and gray. So this fragment right here could be from exactly this rock over here that I have. So maybe this stuff erupted first, sat in the ash bed, and then another eruption occurred, blowing this stuff away up into the air, and it fell with the ash and got buried in the ash bed. You can see there's a chunk of pumice. Actually, right here, this whole chunk right here, the size of my thumb, is a large chunk of pumice as well, or used to be. And then again, it got thick, and due to the gravity, it started to slide down slope, moving all these grains and starting to make them roll and deforming the pumice within it. So these white areas here, this is all pumice that's been kind of flattened and squeezed and deformed under the uh, pressure of the ash bed as well as the high temperatures down below, eventually creating this welded tuff. So looking at these rocks, you can kind of get an idea of the eruption history. So if this was possibly from a first eruption, because I'm assuming it's one of these rocks here, so that's like one eruption, and another eruption came up, blew it away, and buried it in another ash bed. So pretty interesting. But there's a lot you can learn from these rocks. Now this is actual lava rock, I believe, from an actual lava flow, I believe. And then here you have a giant, well not giant, size of my thumb again, little clast of looks like some granite material. So this could be maybe the Idaho bath lift, or maybe even an Eocene pluton. Probably Idaho bath lift. Now this big rock and this rock I actually collected a couple years ago in that first video. And along with this rock, so I mentioned there's probably some hydrothermal alteration. I originally thought several years ago that um, this was rhyolite, but now looking at it, this is probably a hydrothermally altered volcanic rock or even welded tuff. So at volcanic systems, you're going to have hot water, and that hot water can interact with the rock, creating hydrothermal um, deposits or alteration in hydrothermal systems. So this rock right here is just probably a whole bunch of alterated rock from hot steam and water going through the volcanic rock because at any volcanic system you're going to have water which is going to create things like those hot springs and fumaroles that you see at volcanic systems today so that's probably what this is pretty cool and if you look on this rock it's pretty weathered but got a nice cool golden piece of muscovite all right this is some of the volcanic rock we got from potato hill my favorite is definitely the welded tuff with all the pumice class and these little chunks of rock here just shows the violent eruption history at Potato Hill. Definitely I'll have to go back there and explore more of it. Maybe find even cooler volcanic rock. And what's cool about this is it kind of tells the history and story of the volcano that it's no longer really doing anything. It's a well extinct system, but again, rocks are a window into the past and they tell their own story of what happened. So definitely should be going back there when I get a chance to explore more of the area and hopefully find some more cool rocks. So anyways, now let's jump onto Google Earth and look at it from there at the geologic maps I've created. Let's go. All right, so now we're in Google Earth looking at Potato Hill and Cherry Butte from above. I have created a geologic overlay, which is showing the volcanic rock of Potato Hill on the image in Google Earth, which is shown as this kind of reddish brown overlay. Here's the town of Deary, which is just right at the base of Potato Hill. So here's the top of Potato Hill. This is where I hiked up to in the video. And I just followed this road right up to the top. There's the cell tower. And uh, for some reason, Google Earth with the terrain gives it a much more jagged looking peak than it actually has. But ignoring that, you can get a nice visual representation of the lava rocks that are in the area, or the volcanic rocks, I should say, with relating to the Potato Hill Volcanics. This black line right here is a fault line that they have mapped on the geologic map, and it is the these two faults are actually the closest faults to the Potato Hill outcrops themselves. There's some other faults out here. Uh, the black ones are normal faults, 
Uh, and the orange one up here is like a thrust fault. And have some other faults back here as well. And right now I only have the Potato Hill Volcanics turned on just to show where they're at. You can see there's the largest outcrop is at Potato Hill and Cherry Butte. But you also have some isolated outcrops out here. And the furthest one is this little small outcrop over here. But if I zoom out somewhere, I believe it's in one of these canyons. Actually, I think I have to turn on one of my over other overlays, which I'm going to do now. So you can probably see right over here, I have all these folders. I got fault lines, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary, earthquakes that I've been mapping. But I'm going to go to my igneous, and I'm going to turn on my subvolcanic intrusives, which I'm going to choose just all of them. We'll just turn them all on. I have them separated from Miocene to Eocene in age. So when I do that, now if we come over here, there it is. We can see that there's more Potato Hill related volcanic rock right over here. And these are sub volcanic intrusives because I believe they are, yep, the Porthritic Dacite Dikes. And if I actually, if I just go to properties, it will tell you Porthritic Dacite Dikes and plugs from Eocene. So apparently this area right here is potentially uh, a plug or obviously either a plug or dike where the actual magma was feeding from below. So this area here could potentially be one of the sources for the eruption, feeding one of the eruptions. And then most of the volcanic rock has either been buried or eroded away from this location but if we go back to Potato Hill, you can see there's a little dike of the stuff right here cutting into the lava flows or the existing lava rock, ash flow rocks, your welded tufts. And then also we have this little plug right here. So this is possibly another vent plug that was feeding an eruption. So this one possibly could have been one of the vents for a lot of these rocks as well. Even though it is small, there's probably several buried vents or plugs and dikes underneath all this area because if I go back to the folders here, I close these. If I turn on the go to the extrusive sen uh, settings and I go to the Miocene, you have the Columbia River basalts. And when I turn this on, you can see the area is surrounded largely by the Columbia River basalts. And I don't even have them all added on here, so there's likely even more, like all this gap area is probably more Columbia River basalt, as well as the Lata, I believe it's pronounced Lata, Lata, Lata. <laughs> Anyways, it's a sedimentary formation made up of like lake bed sediments and stuff. So there's a lot of that as well. That's probably what a lot of this is. You can actually find some nice fossils in the area because of that formation. Um, anyways, the Columbia River basalts came in, they flowed in, and they buried a lot of the existing rock, including probably more Potato Hill volcanics. So you can see the Columbia River basalts obviously in contact with this group here. So I'm sure there's a lot more of this volcanic rock we just can't see because it's buried. And if we go back to this outcrop, that is exactly what the case was with this until this little... Um, gorge here was eroded out and exposed the underlying volcanic plug or dike here. So if it wasn't for this erosion, we wouldn't even know this was here because the basalt would be burying it. Oh, there's another one right there. Would you look at that? Another little outcrop of Potato Hill related dikes and plugs. So you can see there's a lot of Columbia River flood basalt. And this just shows the largest outcrop of the Potato Hill volcanic rock. So this is probably where they believe the caldera is. So maybe this fall right here, maybe this is one of the ring faults possibly for the caldera, who knows. It's probably bigger. This is just the mapped section that they have on the geologic map, so perhaps underneath the subsurface, underneath the basalt, maybe the fault continues on. and Maybe it does curve around and uh, come this way, but I guess more research would need to be done to determine that. Um, another thing I can do, because when I was in the uh, this area and I was hiking along, I said we had Eocene and Cretaceous 
intrusives like plutonic rocks. So I'll show you that right now. So if I go to the intrusive part, you know what, I'll just turn them all on. So right here you can see we got this giant uh, pluton here. You can see right there that the lava, volcanic lava rocks and ash beds and stuff are all in contact with this plutonic rock. And I believe uh, this area that I haven't mapped here, I think that's more of the granitic pluton sticking up over here. So again, this whole little valley was eroded through. Um, this, of course, wasn't here when this all erupted. So a lot of erosion has taken place to change the way the land looks. But you can see, even over here, we have a very large uh, plutonic rock, the more of the granite rock from the Cretaceous. There's Moscow. You can see there's lots of little faults. And then a lot of the other stuff around here is uh, your sedimentary hosted rock. So actually, I can turn that on too. Uh, actually, yeah, we have the metamorphic and some of the sedimentary. I haven't mapped all of this. This is just a little fun project I work on with Google Earth. So there's a lot of stuff missing, of course. So again, in this unit with the Potato Hill, you can find lithics and little class of the granite as well as the sedimentary metamorphic rocks within the volcanic rock. Because somewhere at depth, the dikes and plugs, these rocks here, were interacting with the country rock down below, and they pulled a little bit of it up to the surface, and it got included within the volcanic rock, which is kind of neat. And then um, I'm going to just turn them all on. So we'll go all igneous now. Oh boy, not all igneous. We don't want to do that, because I forgot I have some other folders that are quite large. We'll turn all those on. There we go. We'll turn on the sedimentary, all the metamorphic. And I think we're good to go here. So, and see right over here, this red, this red line right here is a dike, a rhyolite dike. There's also more dike activity further over here, which is also Eocene in age. So it seems like you had a lot of intrusive activity over here. Then you have your Cretaceous plutons. And somewhere in the area, you have the Eocene ones, too. I believe that's what these are. Nope, that's more of the Cretaceous. Um, but anyways, just a cool little th view of the above geologic area. So real quick, before I go, I'm going to turn off the intrusives. We're just going to leave the extrusives on, and I'm actually going to turn off the uh, Columbia River basalts. So as I mentioned, we have potlatch volcanics that were over here, and that's what these colored rocks are, or not colored rocks, the colored unit for these rocks. So all of this rock here is all potlatch, and you can see that you got some nice exposures all the way up here as well. But what's interesting is uh, most of your potlatch volcanics are concentrated over here. But somewhere over here, right there it is you have an isolated group of potlatch volcanics way out here. And then, of course, these are all dikes right here from Eocene, I believe. So you have this isolated potlatch volcanic rock way out here, and then you have the very large group of, grouping of it here. So what's probably happened was this location, it probably preserved it best, and then all the other potlatch has since been eroded away. And now you just have these isolated outcrops way over here, as well as over here. So here's more of your potlatch as well. And the potlatch was also buried by the Columbia River basalt. And that's why we have these exposures following these gorges here, because the rivers and stuff, uh, waterways have eroded into the bedrock, exposing these outcrops. So there's likely a lot more of the potlatch volcanics buried beneath all the Columbia River. But you can see here, there's some isolated pieces of it up here as well. So that also shows the uh, level of erosion because these lavas used to be much higher up, much thicker until that erosion took place. And when these were actively erupting, you can see that the flow maybe originated from maybe where the Potato Hill volcanics are somewhere. Maybe the lava was flowing this way and it hit this mountainous area and it flowed into this valley and flowed this way. So, kind of interesting. This is a fun little project I've been working on in Google Earth, so I just take geologic maps and I make these really cool overlays. And geologic maps on their own are pretty neat, but 
I feel like when you throw it in the Google Earth, you can do so much more because you can look at things in 3D, you can get up close, and you can actually look at the satellite images, the satellite overlay, as well as the geologic overlay at the same time. So you can see exactly where things are at. So eventually I would like to work over this way and find that plug that I just recently turned off the file for. So let me go back to intrusive, no, nope, subvolcanic, we'll just turn it on, there it is. I would like to go over here and see if I could find this and see what the rock looks like. Um, I've already tried this dike back this way, but a lot of private property back here and everything's pretty buried underneath all the silts and stuff so it wasn't very hard to uh, not hard it was hard to find a nice outcrop of this because it's pretty weathered so i think i'd have better luck with this large outcrop over here or finding my way down into the canyon right over here possibly um this one doesn't look like it'll be very easy to get into either looks like a lot of private property but who knows all right so this was Potato Hill, as seen in Google Earth. And that'll do it for the video. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. Took a nice hike out there and found some nice rocks. Looked at the rock outcrops and got a better idea and understanding of the actual rocks I collected. And then, of course, you know, looking at it on Google Earth, which can definitely help visualize uh, geologic history and past when you add all these things together. So, I hope you all enjoyed this video. And uh, I'll see you all in the next one. You all take care.